Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word, that you, like a newborn baby, that you may grow thereby. His divine power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, uh, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Before we open God's word together this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we are so thankful we have your word because it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We are without it in darkness, and we would have no knowledge of salvation. We would have no knowledge of our spiritual life. We would be cast adrift completely on our opinions, and building life on a people's opinions is like building a house on quicksand. It is self-destructive. Father, we pray that we might honor your word, recognize the significance that we have in having a Bible, having your word that for the most part is accurately translated, helping us to understand how to think, how to live, how to conduct ourselves in the midst of a dark and perverted world, that we may honor and glorify you and that we may shine as lights, giving the gospel and helping people understand the truth. As we study your word today, enlighten us as to its significance and meaning in our own lives, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're studying this passage starting in verse 17, going down through verse 24, that is one of the most important and central passages uh, having to do with the spiritual life. If you'll notice in verse 25, it begins with a therefore. And we all know that when you see a therefore, you have to see what it's there for. And it's drawing a conclusion and that conclusion is drawn from what is said in verses 17 to 24. So if you don't get the interpretation of verses 17 to 24 right, then your conclusion is going to be wrong and your understanding of the conclusion is going to be wrong. One of the things that I think is an earmark of my ministry, my understanding of the role of the pastor as the one who is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry if we have to understand what the Word of God is saying. A lot of times we read it and we, well, I'm not really sure what that's talking about. We encourage people to read through the Bible once a year, and especially in some of the Old Testament books, they get bogged down in certain areas and they're not really sure what's going on there, and that's fine, that's understandable. Sometimes it takes 8, 10, 20, 30 readings before it begins to make sense. Like a lot of things in life, if you don't do the spade work of those first 18, 20, or 30 readings, you'll never get to the 31st reading when it makes sense. But most people don't have, as my mother used to say, the stick to to hang in there. And this passage, for various reasons, as I'll talk about as we go, is one of those passages for me that has... Uh, I, I, I've known their problems. I just did not quite grasp what the solutions were. And I think several things had to come together, first of all, in my own thinking, then in uh, scholarship before I was satisfied. Uh, it's funny like that with pastors is that we come out of seminary, and for about the first 10 years that you're teaching, I don't care who you are, you're teaching what somebody else taught you. And gradually, after you kind of control that, because that's what happens during the first 10 years, you're one step ahead of the hounds, 
And I remember a Dr. Stan Toussaint, who was a lovely, wonderful man, one of the profs at Dallas when I was a student there, uh, was hired right out of seminary to teach. And he said, he, I got up every morning and threw up for the first two years. Because he had stayed up late the night before just to get his material together to lecture the next day. And if anybody asked him about what was coming up in the next verse, he was lost. He hadn't gotten there yet. And that's the way it is. I tell these young pastors, I said, you really, you know, we live in the world, everybody wants to have you on the internet. Well, you're going to be embarrassed in 30 years that people are listening to the first 10 years of what you taught because you're just learning it. Oh, not that it's bad, but you're going to go back and go, oh. So that, that, that's a challenge. And there are passages that take time to work through for anyone, but uh, pastors as well. And this passage is one of about six or seven that I would describe as first tier foundational passages for understanding the spiritual life. The problem is it is normally and historically wrongly translated in English translations. That's a problem. This passage, along with Romans chapters 6 through 8, which is very much, very important, Ephesians 5, which we'll be getting to next, Galatians 3, verse 3, uh, Galatians 5, 14 to 26, John 15, 1 through 6, the passage on abiding, as well as 1 John 1, 6 through 9, I would say form that foundation. If you don't get those right, you're not going to be right on the spiritual life. And we've gone through most of those, and what I'm talking about isn't going to really, ch isn't going to change what I've said about those things. It may change what I've said in the past about this passage, but then we're going to go back and before we're done, uh, I'm going to correlate it to these other passages because that's, uh, that's very important. The passage itself is filled, especially verses 20. Uh, 2, 23, and 24 with very difficult Greek grammar and syntax. And so it's taken me a while to dig through a lot of this. And uh, one of the things that I've done is I have found uh, inf good information, some of which I just hadn't had time to look at before, in working through this that I've had to read oh, 10, 15, 20 times before it really sinks sinks in. So don't feel like, well, this is over my head. It may be. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to bring it down. And in order to do that, I propose that over the next four Sundays, we're going to look at this passage. And today, I want to do kind of an overview. Today, I want to tell you what it is saying. Now, I also believe that it's important as a pastor not only to tell you what a passage is saying, but what a pass how you get there especially when it involves uh, changing translations. When we teach study in the Bible, most of you have taken Bible study methods courses. I've taught them here. We've had others teach it there. Uh, we offer the course at Chafer Seminary, which is a good course to, to take. There's basically three stages to Bible study, to really studying anything. The first stage is observation where we ask the question, well, what does the text say? What's going on here? Now, to answer that question, you have to ask questions about, well, what do these words mean? And if you have some facility in the original languages, you have to go back and find out what are the words in the original language? What's the Hebrew word? What's the Aramaic word? What's the Greek word? Once you come to understand that, then you have to look at the English words that you translate it by and ask, well, which English word relates to this context? Okay, it's not just a matter of looking the word up and in some of the more simple lexicons, like if you have a Strong's Concordance, you look in the back, you look up the word, and it gives you two English words. Those words are not defining the Greek word or the Hebrew word. They're telling you the two or three most common English words that are used to translate that word. But you have to look up in a dictionary in English to find out what those English words actually mean. 
because sometimes there's, even though a word can have a, has a range of meanings, and in some contexts it kind of has this over here on the right, and other contexts something a little bit different or, or maybe significantly different on the left. You have to figure out, okay, what, how's that being used in this passage? And then the structure, that's where you get into what everybody loves, and that's the grammar and the syntax, how the words relate to one another, how the phrases and clauses relate to one another, and what that tells you in terms of uh, what the writer or the author is, is uh, telling you. So that, that's all part of observation as well as asking all the basic questions like who's talking, who are they talking to, uh, when was this said, what are the circumstances, uh, all of those kinds of basic, basic questions. Howard Hendricks made a wonderful observation in his book on Bible study methods um, where he says, the more time you spend on observation, the less time you have to spend on application. You start with observation, and if you spend about 80% of your time just talking about what does it say, then you end up spending about 10% answering the, the interpretation question, what does it mean? Because it's pretty obvious once you understand what is said, what it means. And then when you get to that third question, well, what should I do about it? It's pretty obvious, and the Bible, as usual, has slapped us in the face with the truth. But what most people do is they want to spend 2% of the time on observation. Don't get into all that grammar. Don't tell me about all those words. I just want to know what to do. I want to go home and have five things to do today. Well, then that, that's not a biblical way of thinking because that's not how God gave his word. God did not give his word to give you five principles on how to have a happy marriage or six principles on how to raise your kids so they don't rebel when they're 13 or 20 ways to avoid bankruptcy. That's not how the Bible's written at all. We have to really dig into it and think about it. And you derive some principles related to those topics from what the Word says. But it, it, God designed His Word so that we'd have to really dig into it and we'd have to think about it. So you spend more time on observation. The more time you spend there, the less time on interpretation or application. And um, one of the big problems we've got in working with any translation from another language is that you will find that translators disagree on, well, they use this word or that word, they have different philosophies of translation, and all of those kinds of things which you have to, have to deal with. And that's one of the reasons I do what I do the way I do it, is to help us understand that when I say this should be translated X way, you know why I say that. And I think that's important because you've got scholars who are fairly well adept at the original languages who are translating and say, well, those guys are really smart. They have their PhDs, blah, 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 blah. Well, when I went through Dallas Seminary, one of the things that was really beaten into us in language courses was when you get through with four, three or four years of language study and exegetical work here, you can do as good a work as anybody who's translated any version. And that's an important thing to understand. So it's not a matter of, some people think, well, that, that seems pretty arrogant that you're, you're saying this and the these translators say something else. There are a lot of things that go into translation that most people never talk about, the theological framework of the translators. Most translations that we use are compiled by committees. Alan Ross, who was absolutely brilliant, doctorate from Dallas Seminary, PhD from Cambridge, was uh, part of the main translation, one of the upper committees translating the NIV, and he used to tell us in class, he said, I wanted to put an asterisk in the margin that this is the word of God by a vote of five to four. So we have to understand that, that there's differences that come into play here, and theology is cer certainly one of them. So what I want to do as we go through this is that today I want to give you an overview, hit the high points, tell you what this passage is saying, what it's not saying, and why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Next time we're going to have to come back and review it because you won't catch but a small portion of it today. 
And we'll focus a little bit more on some of the details and getting into some broader relationships. This passage is clarified in its relation to two or three other passages. And then in two weeks, we'll come back and look in more detail at those um, related passages in Colossians and Romans and Galatians. And then in um, three weeks, we'll come back and just kind of summarize it, put it all together. It's not going to change the way you look at the spiritual life, but it's going to help you understand some of these things that are said in these other passages. It's going to refine your understanding. It's going to tighten the focus. For some of you who have not been around long, this is going to be uh, this will be good for you. The Bible study isn't easy. I try to bring it down so we can make it understandable. Uh, I often remember when I was in high school and I was on the work crew at Camp Penile and David Whitelock was taking us through Ephesians. And every day he would assign five or six verses and we had to go back and write a paraphrase. Now, we, all we had was, back, back in the late 60s, all you had was the King James Version. That was really tough trying to figure out what that said and then put it into you know, some kind of understandable modern English. So uh, that was the challenge. But it, it's a lot better today. We have a lot more up-to-date things. So what this is talking about is the reality that, that the old man is dead and gone and it's not part of our life anymore. Now, some of you have already gone, well, wait a minute, I thought the old man was the sin nature. No, it's not. I've never taught that. You've never heard it from me. Um, and that was a totally wrong conclusion. We'll eventually get into the details there. But this is the foundation to understand the basis for the, this new life we have in Christ. So let's just look at these three verses, and I want to highlight a, a, a few things. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So that takes us to the main thing that we see going on here is that we are in a section of Ephesians from the beginning of chapter 4 to the middle of, of chapter 6 talking about how we should live. This walking metaphor is important. And we are not, there, this is a complete break with how the rest of the Gentiles uh, live. That is those who are unbelievers in the emptiness of their thinking. And I'll notice that when we get down into uh, verse 23, uh, there's a contrast to what we have here, the futility of their thinking. There's a contrast in verse 23 with be renewed in the spirit of your mind or spirit of your thinking. So that's the contrast for the believer. And then it describes a problem, and we've gone through this in detail the last few weeks, that, uh, that because of the depravity of our nature and sin, we, are, uh, we really have a hardness of heart our understanding is darkened, we're spiritually dead, alienated from the life of God. And the culture, and we described this in detail the last few weeks, and especially last week and the week before, the history of the thinking that formed the culture, the pagan culture that we see around us. But there's a contrast in verse 20, but you have not learned Christ in such a way. What, what Paul is saying here is, the Christian life, you were taught the Christian life, and it's not based, and it does not look anything like the life of the fallen Gentile world around you. He then says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Actually, there's no the in the Greek there. It's, an, it's without an article indicating the qualitative nature of truth, as truth is in Jesus. He's the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, when you Look at this slide. I've highlighted the three main verbs 
finite verbs and in the first two verses. First, he says, you have not learned. Mathetes is, uh, matheteo is the Greek verb, and it's the word that's sometimes translated uh, discipling, uh, to disciple. But it means to be a student, to be a learner. Uh, you have not learned. In other words, this is not what you were taught. Who would have taught them? Let's go back to the context. In Ephesians 4, 1, we're told to walk according to the high calling of the new life we have been given. And then when we get down into the middle of that first section, we learn that Christ gave gifts to the church, in order, and these gifted leaders are to equip us to live the Christian life. They are the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers. All we have today are evangelists and pastor teachers. So what he's saying here is the gifted men that Christ gave the church did not teach you to live your Christian life in this manner. You did not learn from the evangelists and pastor teachers to live your Christian life in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. So here he emphasizes that the teaching came by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, as Paul says, says elsewhere, and that you have been taught by him, by Christ. Christ is ultimately the one who teaches us, but he does it through these gifted leaders. As truth is in Jesus, that emphasizes that what we are taught is truth, and the truth here is that which comes from the Bible. This is not abstract truth. It's not philosophical truth. It is the truth of Scripture. It is what the Word of God says. It is the teaching of Scripture or Bible doctrine. That's what this is talking about, truth. This is in Jesus. And then what happens here is you get a, a two or three infinitives in the grammar that you put off. And they all relate back to that verb taught. So the main verb is that you have been taught by him. And the explanation of the content of that teaching comes in the next three verses. It's introduced in the King James by a that, which is introducing indirect discourse. Y'all remember that from school. You have direct discourse. John said, I'm going to the store. And then some third person says in indirect discourse, John said he was going to the store. No, John said, comma, quote, I am going to the store. Close quote. Indirect discourse, somebody tells his mother, John said he was going to the store. That's indirect discourse. So the, that is correct here. It's introducing indirect discourse. What was taught that you put off concerning your former conduct. So you have these three infinitives. Now, infinitive in English is when you put a to, T-O, in front of the verb. So you have, I am walking. That's the main verb. If you say, I am to walk, to walk is your infinitive. The verb is am. So the infinitive explains something in addition to what is said in the main, in the main verb. But that's, we'll get into some of that next week. But it's important how you understand this. So when it says, translates this indirect discourse that you put off and be renewed and that you put on, that that you put off and that you put on sounds like what? It sounds like a command. It sounds like an imperative. And what I'm going to tell you is that it's not an imperative. That is wrong. That is a wrong, in, wrong understanding of the grammar. We'll get into those details. And what are we supposed to put off? We're supposed to put off the old man and put on the new man. Or actually, because of the tense of the infinitives, we have already put off. See, if it's imperative, it's something you haven't done yet, and you need to do it. You need to put off the old man, and you need to put on the new man. And that is a major way in which it's translated, and people understand this. 
But the reality is that if those infinitives are in the past tense, that they're talking about something that has already happened. In other words, it's not an imperative, it's what's called an indicative. It's a statement of reality as things are. So that's, that's a big part of just understanding that. Now, when we go back and we look at what we studied in Ephesians, we have to be reminded of some things, otherwise we'll, we'll get confused a little. First thing is that in Ephesians, we've seen that a major theme, a major focus for, for the Christians he's writing is for, to help them understand their corporate reality in Christ. If you remember back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse, verse 3, we read uh, Paul saying that uh, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. That is our legal position. At salvation, we become a new creature, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, a new creature in Christ. Behold, all things are passed away, all things are new. We are a new creature in Christ at the instant of our salvation. And that's this body of Christ that we have. That's what we mean by a corporate nature. It's not talking specifically to individuals. It's talking to the entity of the body of Christ. So that by focusing on that, that also applies to individuals, but it tells us that... Uh, Let's, let's give, let me give you an illustration. Let's say that your father says something about this is the way the family is going to live. This is what we're going to do. This is our lifestyle. The family is a corporate noun. Now, does what, it, and now is what is true about the family to apply to every individual in the family? Yes. But the reality, it flows from the identity in that family, that, that corporate noun. Same thing might be that uh, you might talk about a nation. Nation is a corporate entity. Americans do X. That's talking about the American, those who are part of that nation, this is what they do. Does that apply to the individuals? Not always everyone, but that's what they're supposed to do. It's stating the, the, the corporate nature there. This will become a little more clear as we go along. So at the instant of our salvation, we are baptized by means of the Holy Spirit. So this is fundamental to understand where I'm going with this and where Paul goes with this is we have to understand that at the instant of salvation, we are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, and we are placed in Christ. That is our new position and our positional reality. This is not experiential. That means you're not going to feel it. You're not going to have some sort of new boost in your life. You might. But it's not necessary. It's not indicative of whether or not you're saved. You could be hungover. You could be um, tired. You may not have slept for three or four days. You may be dying from cancer, and you're in misery and pain. And there's not going to be some sort of emotional lift or experience or anything like that. But the reality is there anyway. It's non-experiential. It's not repeated. It happens once at the instant that we trust Christ as Savior. We are baptized by means of the Holy Spirit into Christ. And he is the one who performs, ultimately performs the baptism. And it's not lost. We can't lose our salvation. We can't lose our identity in Christ. Now, the second thing is that this new corporate identity is identified in Ephesians as the church. It's so important. This church is something totally new in history. Never before in history has there been a people of God that have been blessed with everything you and I have been blessed with. It is phenomenal. It is remarkable. It's nothing like Israel in the Old Testament. There are some similarities, but it's the differences that are important. We've kind of lost that idea. Uh, sometimes in uh, the study of Scripture, people say, well, th this is similar to this, so they must be identical. No, it's not similarities that are important. Men and women have a lot of similarities. It's the differences that are important. 
The church has some similarities to Israel, but the differences make it a completely different entity. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, uh, we are told that we are his workmanship. And I talked about that word a good bit when we went through there, that we are his, um, we're his masterpiece. We are his, um, you, you could say we're, we're his, um, uh, what would the word be? Um, we're his, uh, we're his, it, it, we're his creation. We're something special. And it has that idea of creation there. What's interesting is whenever we have this word new man used in Scripture, it always is tied to a mention of creation as we see in verse 15. Uh, having abolished in its flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments, uh, contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. One new man from the two. That is making peace. What did he do? He created in himself. See, that word create is tied to what happens. He created this new man. That's the first time we see the word new man used in Scripture. Does it refer to something that's individual? No, it refers to the church. The church is the new man, not the individual. There is, that's a big key to understanding what's going on in Ephesians 4, and that's going to blow your paradigm. Whatever framework you had for understanding it before is gone now because new man is not used to refer to a new individual creation in you. It refers to the church, the body of Christ. That is transformative. We are a new man. Ephesians 2.16, we're called a new body, a new, we're the body of Christ in Ephesians 2.21, we're called a new building. In Ephesians 2.21b, we're called a new temple. It's all corporate. This is what we are. We're a new entity. It's a, it's a new family, a new body. Now, in terms of God's perspective, there really is only one race. There's not this racial difference. That's just bogus human viewpoint. There's just the human race. Until... Christ, until Pentecost, when the church was born, there were only two races, Jew and Gentile. Before Abraham, there was only Gentiles. But with Abraham, God called out a new special people. Those are the only legitimate distinctions within the human race. You have two peoples up till that point. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10:32, give no offense. See, the problem is that he that that there were questionable things, uh, uncertain things whether that, that believers were asking him about whether they should do it or not. It really wasn't a moral issue. And he lays down the closing principle here that don't offend people. You know, think about other people and deciding what you're going to do in certain areas. Give no offense either to who? A, the Jews. These are unsaved Jews. B, the Gentiles, the unsaved Gentiles. Who's the third entity? The church. There's only three groups of people on planet Earth, according to God. There's Jews, Gentiles, and the church. And if you're a Jew or an unsaved Jew or Gentile and you trust in Christ, then you're a member of the church. You may still be an ethnic Jew or an ethnic Gentile, but what matters is that you're in the church. When the rapture occurs, you're going to go up with the church, even if you're Jewish. According to Romans chapter 11, God always has Jewish believers in every generation as, and as part of the body of Christ, but there's a distinction in this, this time period that they're part of the church. So we have to keep those two things in mind, that this is talking about uh, corporate reality, no, number one, and number two, that this corporate reality is the church. And the third thing is that he, he's talking about this metaphor of walking, that is how we live, how we think, how we live, how we talk, how we act, how we prioritize, where we spend our time. And this is what comes up in Ephesians 4.1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, bespeech, beseech you, to walk worthy of the high position with which you have been called. We have a new identity that is in 
Christ. We are to conduct our life in a manner worthy of this exalted position, as I've translated that in the past. That's a positive command. If you think through chapter 4, he explains what this talks about initially, that now there is a unity of the Spirit. There's one body and one Spirit, Holy Spirit. The one body is now composed of what? Jew and Gentile united together in one body. That's the church. So he says we are to keep this unity. We're not to split over Jew versus Gentile, but there is to be peace. That's what he talks about back in Ephesians chapter 2, that in verse 16, where he says that he might reconcile them both, both to God. And then in verse 7, he starts talking about the spiritual gifts that Christ distributes to the church for the purpose of equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. So we're taught by the evangelists and pastor teachers that that's the priority is that's who God ordained as the ones who are to uh, train us in the work of the ministry. So after he lays the groundwork, tells us that we have to maintain this unity, he, Christ provides us with those leaders who will teach us how to maintain the unity, and now he's going to contrast it with uh, the Gentiles. It's not going to be like the Gentiles around you. Don't look outside the church, outside the Scripture, to get your model for how you're going to live your life. You don't want to be like the Jews in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 8 where they said, we want to have a king like everybody else. You don't want to say, I want to live my life like everybody else. Not if you're a believer in Christ. You, why would you lower yourself from the top of the Empire State Building to the gutter to just to, because it looks like it's fun? In the end, it's not. So then we come to the problem. The problem is, stated by Dan Wallace in his excellent grammar, Greek grammar beyond the basics, he says, in understanding these, these infinitives, he said, this is a difficult problem pregnant with exegetical implications. What that means is the implications of how you take this one way or the other is filled with distinctive consequences for how you understand the spiritual life. And it's, important, it's an important problem, and some discussion is necessary. So here's the grammar issue. There's these two aorist infinitives. Now, an aorist tense is not something we have in English, but it's in Greek. It's a, basically a simple past tense. Let's just keep it at, leave it at that. It's a simple past tense. So what you have here is you have two uh, infinitives, to put off and to put on. Okay, so let's use a different verb. Let's say walk. Okay, so present tense is to walk. Would you ever say to walked, past tense? No. You don't have, in English, we don't have a past tense for an infinitive. But, the, but Greek does. So it makes it difficult to translate that into, uh, over into English. But basically what it's saying is that this is something, when it talks about putting on, it's something that's happened in the past, not something that is commanded to do in the future. Okay? So it's common to translate this with this imperatival idea that you should put on, you should put off. That would be something future. The reality is there's only two clear cases of in, infinitives used as imperatives in the whole New Testament, and there's other things that have to be there for that to be true, and they're not there here. So if he's not saying you should do this, then what he is saying is you have already done this, and now because of that, do this. Renew your mind. Okay? So you have put off the old man, you have put on the new man. That happened at salvation. As a result of that, renew your mind, and it's a present infinitive. That's the same thing that he's saying over in uh, Romans 12 2. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed or pressed into the mold of the spirit of the age, but be completely transformed by the renewing of your thinking. 
Now, there's three possible views here. The first, as I've said, is challenging individuals to put off or put on. Individuals, that's an important term. What have I been stressing so far? What's Paul talking about? Individuals or corporate? Corporate. So first view is it's all about individuals to put off and put on, and so it's interpreted as something that we have individually. The second view is that each individual believer has already put on or put off. Each individual should do something. So it's individual focus. So that would mean that each of us individually have put off an individual old man and put on an individual new man. But as I've said, we're talking corporate all through, all through Ephesians. And that's the third point. This is not individual but corporate. This is the new reality of those who are in the body of Christ. When you were baptized by means of the Spirit, entered into Christ, where it says there's no more Jew, Gentile, male or female, bond or slave, be all, we're all one in Christ, that's corporate. Okay, remember what I, I just quoted from Galatians. Remember that. So... The next thing we have to deal with is this issue of old man, new man. The first view is that the old man equals the old sin nature. You'll find a lot of older uh, commentaries and pastors who taught that. The old man is the sin nature, but that doesn't work. When it talks about putting to death the sin nature, we don't put it to death. It died already. I mean, the power of it died already. That happened as a result of baptism by the Spirit. That's Romans 3, 6, I mean, Romans 6, 3 through 6. So it's not the sin nature. We'll get into some of the details on that as to why it's not the sin nature, but it's, it, it can't be the sin nature, especially if it is saying that you have put it off and you have put on the new man. And, and see, so some people are going to come along and say, well, this is what's going on in Galatians 5, where you have like, like you know, you may have heard the, you, you have a black dog inside you and a white dog, and which dog you feed is the one that's going to grow. It, it, that's not what it's talking about. Galatians 5 is talking about you either walk by the Spirit or you walk by the sin nature. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a corporate reality of our new identity in Christ. So when we look in the mirror, we should look in the mirror. We are royal family of God. We have been adopted into his family. We are new creatures in Christ. I am not what I was before I was saved. So the second view is that the old man, and this is what I have taught for years, the old man is all that we were before we were saved. And that, and that makes sense. Un, but unfortunately, that's the individual idea, not the corporate idea. So it's true, but it doesn't go far enough. And then the third view, the view that I am teaching, is that the new man is the church. That fits contextually with how that phrase has already been used in the book. We are a new man. We're in the new man. We, the new man is the church. We are in the new body, the new temple, the new building. And it's part of that identity that we have for the church. What I'm doing is I'm taking whatever view you had of the body of Christ of the church, and I am intensifying it and blowing it way out of proportion to what you ever thought. It is, this is one of the most profound things about the significance of being in the body of Christ in the church for all of eternity. You know, you get into covenant theology, we're just, you know, we're just like the Jews. Basically, Jew and Gentile, the, uh, Jew, the Jews in the church were all just the people of God. Totally loses the significance of what this means. So the contrast comes out of verse, verse 20, but y'all have not so learned Christ. You didn't learn him this way. Indeed, you have heard him and have been taught by him. So the main verb here is didasco, uh, which means to teach or to instruct. It is a verb of communication. That's really important. We'll get to some of the details on that, but, but when you ha bas basically for years, there was a 19th century grammarian who said that if you have a construction like this, it's uh, with a, it, then this word uh, with teaching takes on imperatival sense, and so do the infinitives. And everybody just went with that. 
Then, we, with the advent of computers, we've been able to do a lot of studies we could never do before. And what was determined was that that was generally true, but it wasn't true, and there were, there were a lot of examples in the New Testament where a verb followed by, by an infinitive wasn't expressing a command. It was uh, expressing a state of reality, uh, the indicative mood. Well, that changes a lot, but that study was done in the early 90s. So just about anybody who taught anything before that was just following this rule set down by a Greek grammarian in the late 19th century. When I was, whatever I was, 24 maybe, went to Dallas Seminary. Now, I had always heard from several different pulpits I had been in that Dallas Seminary was just, they had it all together. Well, they didn't. Unfortunately, that misled a number of people who, when they got to Dallas Seminary and heard something different, they said, oh, I've been told to trust Dallas Seminary, so they must be right and my pastor must be wrong. And, um, and you didn't realize that you have like five different models in church history of, how to, of the Christian life in the Bible. One's Roman Catholic, one's Lutheran. You have the Reformed view, you have the Keswick view, and you have uh, what John Walver called the dispensational, Augustinian dispensational view of spiritual life. I'm not going to get into any of those details, but, but if you don't know that going in, you don't know that when you're sitting down in front of a professor that he may be coming from a totally different perspective than what I had ever been taught. I had no idea. And so he was teaching uh, spiritual life from a Reformed pr perspective. Now, he had the grammar right here, but he didn't have his conclusions right on, on some things. And I uh, didn't understand it in terms of entity, and it was just confusing. And for 40 years, I've wrestled with, I, with how do you understand these things? Because he was taking these, and in his case, it was kind of a, a mix of some things. He was actually um, taking these, these uh, infinitives as imperatival. So it just led to a lot of confusion. But this was in 76, this other study that came out was in 91. A lot of people changed since then. So it's, um, it's important to understand that there have been so, some of these changes. So f verse 22 says uh, that you put off in the King James, and that has this idea of a command to, that you're, we're supposed to put off the old man. But... If it's indicative, it's talking about something that's already been done, and I would translate it, y'all took, took off concerning your former manner. Y'all took off, past tense. It's been taken off, removed. Y'all took off the old man which is growing corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So that makes a lot more sense. We have, see a problem here. We a lot of people here have looked at the oh, Gordon Olson's Resurrection New Testament, which is good in a lot of ways, but it's bad here. And notice how he translates this. However, you are not discipled that way, assuming you heard about the Messiah and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. That's good so far. But you were taught, what? To put off your old self. See, that's not what it's saying. That's, that's typical old, old school. Uh, and to... Um, and you were taught to put on the new self. So he takes it that way. However, Darby, John Nelson Darby, for those of you who don't know, he was the first to really articulate dispensational theology. It wasn't new to Darby. Uh, the main ideas in dispensationalism had been there for centuries, going back into the early church, but he's the first to really systematize it and organize it. Darby went to Trinity College, Dublin, and he graduated the head of his class. He took a first in Greek. He was absolutely brilliant in Greek. There is a, he wrote a translation of the New Testament, and this is how he translated this. He got it right. If you have heard him and been instructed in him according as the truth is in Jesus, namely, you're having put off. See, he gets the grammar. You're having put off. You have put it off. It's, over, it's, it's in the past tense. You're having put off according to the former conversation, the old man which corrupts itself according to the deceitful lust, and being renewed, present tense. And verse 24, and you're having put on the new man. See, he sees that as a past reality. 
Now, here's the ESV. They're trying, okay? And they're, they're, they do, see, they put a two in here. Uh, they don't get the whole thing right, but they say to put off your old self and to put on. So they're, put it, they're at least trying to get the, that, the fact across that it's an infinitive. But the Holman Christian Standard Bible translates it this way. You took off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. See, but they still take it individually. They, it should have been translated correctly as old man, not old self. That makes it more individual and personal. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You have put on, past tense, the new self, the one created. Now, what's interesting, just to give you a preview of coming attractions, when you get into the next paragraph, it starts off with a, with a participle, the same verb for took off, or, uh, which is to put away, uh, tithemi, and it's causal, since you put away. But in most translations, it says, since you put away, um, where is it? Putting away lying. That's how the New King James puts it. Putting away lying. That's a terrible translation. Because lying, I-N-G, is a gerund or a participle. There's not a gerund or participle in the Greek. You put off, and it's, it's a noun, and it has an article. You, past tense, put off the lie. What you had before you were saved and your futility of your mind was the lie. But now you're in Christ, you have the truth. And so that's what that's talking about. You put off the lie, and then it, it says, let each one of you speak truth. What's the truth? That's not talking about don't lie to your neighbor. The truth here is the same truth as the truth you have in Jesus Back in verse 21, it's talking about the Word of God, the truth that you're taught from an evangelist and from your pastor teacher. It's a, that's what we're supposed to be talking with our neighbor is the truth of the Word of God. So we put away, we put away the lie, and we're a new creature in Christ, so we are to speak the truth, each one to his neighbor. Now, we get clarification from Colossians 9. We're going to come back to all of this, trust me. Colossians 3, 9 says, do not lie to one another. Totally different issue here than what I just read. This is talking about an individual command to individuals, do not lie to one another. But why do you, are we not to lie to one another? Because you have put off the old man with his deeds. Notice, it's, it's participles here, not infinitives, but they're translated the same. And here they get it correct. Infinitives are confusing. Participles are clear, but they're interchangeable at times. So you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man who is, what? Being renewed, present tense, in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. What is that talking about? That's talking about the baptism by the Spirit. Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, the baptism by the Holy Spirit, have put on, past tense, you have put on Christ. You've put on the new man at the instant of salvation. And what's the characteristic? There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. How does Romans 6, 3 through 6 start? It begins with the baptism by the Spirit that we're all united and baptized, identified in the Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And from that new reality flows all of the commands related to the spiritual life. That's the same thing Paul is saying here in, in Ephesians 4, uh, 21 to 24. He's not saying to put off something. He is saying you've already put it off. The old man is gone. It's not the old sin nature. It's everything you were in Christ, but it's corporate. It's all that we were. When we are entered into the body of Christ, boom, everything is new. That's 2 Corinthians 5. I think I said 20 earlier, 517. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It's all new. That's our new reality. 
But too many Christians are looking at themselves in the mirror and what they see is what they were before they were saved. Not who they are in Christ as a new creature in Christ, living according to a whole new set of standards. What those standards are is what we're going to cover in 25 on. But we've got to come back and go over this again because uh, you're going to go home and try to repeat some of this to somebody. What did Robbie say this morning? And you'll say, I, I, I thought I had it, but it just left my mind. Okay, I know that. I've been wrestling with some of this for, for 40 years, so I know you don't get it the first five or 600 times you hear it. So we have to go through it uh, in different ways over the next couple of weeks and put it all together, okay? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Father, thank you for this opportunity to be able to get into this, this study and to understand who we are in Christ and the difference that makes in terms of who we are and how we are to live today. Father, we pray that we might come to uh, understand the significance of, of this passage for our understanding of, 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 our, own, of our own spiritual life, but it's, it's not divorced from who we are as members of the, of the body of Christ, which is emphasized in verse 25. We are members of one another. Understanding this corporate reality is, is, is a difficult, abstract thing, but it's, it's so important to know who we are and who we are in Christ. Now, Father, we pray that if there's anyone here today or anyone listening online, anyone unaware of, of uh, their salvation, that they might clearly understand that the way to have eternal life is to accept the free gift of salvation by faith in Christ, trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection that he died for our sins, believing on him, we'll have everlasting life. So, Father, we thank you for this new life we have in him. May we not waste it or take it for granted. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's close our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you that we can gather here to learn about your word, to worship you. We thank you for preserving your word for us in our language and for the scholarship of men through the centuries to translate this into our language that we can understand. We thank you for our pastor and the preparation that he's put into this passage to communicate it to us. And we ask that you would help us to walk in light of this reality this week and bring us back next week to continue learning about you. In Jesus' name, amen.